that he had received in 1945 from Robert Antelm, and which he had completely forgotten about. Um, between the time of its, of its composition and the time he received it. And then 1985, 86, when he was asked to search in his papers for any records of the return of Anten from the prison camp, Dachau, uh, the, you know, the, the death camp, um, which occurred in May of 1945. And some of the circumstances of that were contested. This was a time when Marguerite Duras, who was it was Antelm's partner, um, had come out with, with some uh, testimony in her book La Guerre, and there was also a very important interview with Marguerite Duras and uh, François Mitterrand. Now, Mitterrand had been one of the people to, who saved um, Robert Antelm, who was in Dachau. Um, uh, uh, Mitterrand had, a, had, a, had a, a government post, so he was able to enter the camp and actually smuggle Antelm out because there were strictures against moving the, the prisoners out. Um, Mitterrand was there with, um, uh, he brought Dionis Mascolo to help him and a, name, a man, I uh, hope my memory serves me well, Charles Beauchamp. Um, Mitterrand uh, got the, uh, um, Antelm out of the camp. Uh, Mascolo and uh, Beauchamp then drove him back uh, to Paris. And that drive was extraordinarily memorable for Mascolo, uh, not because he could recount exactly what happened. All he could say was that there was an endless flow of speech from Antelm, an endless flow of speech. Antelm wouldn't stop speaking. And uh, Antelm was very near death in these circumstances. In fact, this flow of speech could have killed him in itself. Um, he was very near death, and it took uh, several weeks for the doctors to bring him back to actually a point where they could say he was going to survive. Um, so uh, several weeks, and then uh, within about two weeks after the moment when he was pronounced as recovering, uh, he wrote this letter to Dionis Masculo, and I'm going to read the letter. It's a little bit long, but I hope that this will be of, um, uh, will, 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 will grip you, I think, in the way it has gripped many. It's, it's quite an extraordinary document. Um, I'm going to, so I read the letter. I'm, I'm going to say some words about Masculo's response to the letter, and then I'm going to read another short text by Maurice Blanchot, which I think is in itself also very possibly a response to this letter. Uh, now there's an extremely complicated uh, network of texts involved here because Mascolo, in writing about Antelm in this book, uh, Autour de l'Effort des Mémoires, is inspired by Blanchot. And Blanchot, writing then 10 years after this book, seems to be responding to Antelm after Mascolo. So it's, it's a very fascinating, very complicated uh, intrication of texts. But the issue in, in, both, um, well, in, in both cases, not so much in, Ante, in, in Masculo, but certainly in Blanchot, is the question of a certain right to be commemorating and a right to call upon the other. And this is what I ultimately I want to be looking at. Blanchot calls for, he, he, he actually claims what he calls a right to make the other live. And this right, he, t he in indicates to us, is literary. There's something like a literary right that he exercises. This happens to echo a very important essay by Blanchot, which was written in 1946 and 47, called La, littéra La littérature et le droit à la mort, Literature and the Right to Death. In 1992, I think it was, when he wrote his little essay, he seems to be going back to that notion of a right to death which is a literary right. And this is what I'm turning around. It's an enigmatic thing, it's a very problematic thing, but I'm trying to approach what this might mean and wh what, are the, what are the circumstances of it. So, um, with that uh, somewhat complicated introduction, I enter this text by, uh, this letter by Robert Antin, written in June 1945. Antin starts as follows. I'm going to write a few lines to you. This is Tomasculo. The, uh, the person with whom he'd spent the most intimate hours since his delivery. I'm going to write a few lines to you by which I mean accomplish my first act as a solid living being. Because I've already accomplished numerous acts as a living being. I've cried, for, in for instance, and tears are as far as possible from death. 
But it is you that I write to first because I want you to be able to maintain within yourself, perhaps for a little while longer, the wondrous feeling of having saved a man. I say a while longer because to the same degree the one saved holds eternally before him the image of the Savior. To the same extent, the Savior has tendency to see the image of his act grow indistinct and even to render common the subject he tore from evil. Thus, my dear Dionys, we are in some sense now completely separate. Our consciousness, consciences, respectively, no longer weigh the same. There will always be some indiscretion in my eyes, in my words. You will try not to see. I'd like to tell you other things on this subject that seem important to me, but I'm aware that I run a fairly grave danger. Dionys, I think I no longer know what is said and what is not said. In hell, one says everything, and it must be for this that we recognize it. For my part, it is certainly in this way that it was revealed to me. In our world, on the contrary, we are accustomed to choosing, and I believe I no longer know how to choose. Well, in what represented hell for me and others, saying everything was where I lived my paradise. For you must know this, Dionys, that during the first days when I was in my bed and I spoke to you, to you and to Marguerite, first of all, I was not a man of this earth. I stress this fact that haunts me retrospectively. I continue to read. To have been able to give freedom to words that were barely formed and had no years, no age, but took shape in relation to my breath. This, you see, this happiness wounded me definitively. And at this moment, I who believed myself so far from death by some affliction, typhus, fever, and so forth, could think of dying only from this very happiness. And now I have begun again to give a form to things. At least my spirit and my body try to. But I repeat, I think I can no longer choose. In what I am saying, there are surely tremendous vulgarities in what you call in your laughter an incredible tyranny. So am I going to have to reclassify myself, whittle myself down so that one sees only once again a smooth envelope? You'll tell me that my language is ill-fitting and the best oil is one that reveals a thousand rough points without ceasing to be oil. In reality, I believe that the problem I'm posing is nonetheless a moral one. I have the feeling, which perhaps not all of my comrades have, of being a new being, not in Wells's sense of the word, in the fantastic sense, but on the contrary, in the most hidden sense. So that my true sickness, which began so tenderly just a few weeks ago now, and at that time it was still bearable, now reaches its maturity and becomes very intractable. Here is an appendage that grows, a spirit without channels or compartments, a freedom perhaps ready to grasp itself, perhaps ready to annihilate other freedoms, either to kill them or better to embrace them. So if one wanted to see a man take form, one might observe me up close, taking into account the morbid character of the formative process. Forgive me for insisting, it must be unbearable for you who go on to hear someone speak of his original indeterminacy. I think there is even something boorish in all this and that you will be right in answering that in a few months I will have ceased being reborn, that I too will get on and no doubt even along that abandoned path that I left a year ago. You'll tell me this, Dionys, or not. You'll think it or not, depending on whether you will or will not have some faith in man. You are certainly one of the few beings in whom I most fear fatigue, I mean despair. There are many whom I've loved a great deal and whose despair left me indifferent, by which I mean a kind of definitive state. I left them in this state, or I reveled and struggled to bring them back. For you, Dionys, whose despair must constantly mix with joy, flights, and unfathomable pauses, I could not bear that this despair fix itself and become established. I told you I was not afraid, and that such was my sole fear. If you laugh, if you tease me in saying that you have never seen so much future, I will tell you that I recognized in myself the right to have this fear. I stopped there because my hand was hurting, and I'm going to stop there because I don't want to push too long in reading. There is a second part to this letter. Um, the first part is written in the evening. There's a terrible storm that evening. He stops in fatigue, and the next morning he says, I realize that I've been foolish. This is impossible. And he, and he 
he leaves off. There's a kind of closure to the letter. There's a closure to the address that's happened. It's as though there's been a kind of catharsis. That freedom that's been growing, the desperate state he's in of not knowing what to say and what not to say, comes to a culmination in that last statement, I have a right to fear um, your despair. And then, it, and then it closes, and that's it. Um, so there's this little window, and this window, I think, is what is uh, responded to by the authors that I'm, I want to pick up. I think, uh, so now I, 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 I enter into my commentary. I think, you'll, I think you will have heard why, when I was asked to think about the notion of the undecidable, I thought of this letter. Because he's going back and forth. Is it hell? Is it paradise? Am I sick? Am I reborn and healthy? It, it's, it is a constant indeterminacy. He never talks about the indestructible, but the letter addresses the bounds of linguistic freedom and social usage, and thus the laws of propriety, which, come, which come to appear uncertain under the pressure of an imperious need to speak. The undecidable, or what became such for Antelm, involves what can and cannot be said, where the one speaking is driven to say all. What can and cannot be said in a social relation on the one hand, and over against this, what must be said for the preservation of an exceptional relation, where the one who speaks perhaps holds the power to save another or something in another in a special sense. Another who in this case has saved him and upon whom this one saved is still in some degree dependent. I call the situation exceptional, and it certainly is in many respects, but I think we should also recognize its general character in that the act of speech that presents an undecidable character in this case engages something of the speech that Emmanuel Levinas evoked when he referred to a trauma that might be brought to the saying of the other in the ethical relation, that might be brought by the saying of the other in the ethical relation, and to the decision to speak or to kill that also presents itself in that relation. The undecidable in this instance inheres in the ethical relation as such, or what Antelm refers to as a moral problem. And it involves what Antelm does not hesitate to name, despite the doubt and the ambivalence that resonates in all his statements, a right with respect to the other. The conditions for addressing this other are undetermined, profoundly unsure, but a right speaks in this that is not in question, at least not to Antem. The striking surety of Antem's appeal to write in this address to his friend goes unremarked in the 70-odd pages of Mascolo's response. That's the, the text written in 1986, which takes the form of an attempted anamnesis, 40 years after the fact, and devoted to the meaning of the letter and its repercussions in his life. Somehow, Moscolo does not register that reference to a right, even if he seeks to respond to the concern in which Antelm claims his right to fear for Moscolo's ability to remain in the relation to which he is summoned. I'm going to try to suggest why this is true, and in attempting to develop this point, I will juxtapose it, as I was saying a moment ago, to another response from Maurice Blanchot that was composed 10 years after Moscolo's memoir. It's actually difficult to prove that this second text responds in more than an indirect way to Antoine's letter. It could be that Blanchot simply heard the same thing, the same address in a way of speaking and being that Mascolo sought to capture with a term he used for Antoine, which was inconsolé. Antoine was someone who could never be consoled in some way. But I do not doubt that we are dealing with two divergent responses to the same undecidable, the same infinite in the human relation to speech. I'll be very elusive right now, but let me note that Antelm once defined friendship as the multiplication of death and difference. It's a phrase that Deleuze found quite arresting. In the responses of Moscolo and Blanchot to the speech of Antelm, I think we witness something of this kind in a profoundly affirmative form. So let me first turn to Antem's letter and underscore some of its most relevant traits for this, this discussion. To do this at all properly, I must touch very briefly upon its circumstances, which are offered to us by Muscolo's text, but also, as it happens, by a reflection on Antem's experience with language in the time of his internment and deliverance that was offered by Blanchot some years earlier, 
a meditation that had had a profound impact on Moscolo's understanding of what, what happened in the weeks in which he accompanied Anton in his return to the world. The crucial point that I want to underscore here, and I've made it in passing a, a, in my introduction, but I want to underscore the point that in the period of his detention, Anton says that he had withheld speech from his captors, even as he approached the impossibility of even this form of mute refusal. In other words, as he approached the point of, of his actual death. His deliverance, recounted in extraordinary pages by Mascolo, then proved to be a deliverance of speech, an unchecked flow that was received by the two who were closest to Antelm at this time, Mascolo and then Marguerite Duras. This is the speaking to which Mascolo refers, uh, to um, Antelm refers, excuse me, when he speaks of the intense joy he knew in liberating words without age that were formed in and what must have been the most weak and precious breath. This is the speaking in which he presumably experienced what it meant to say everything, and before which he hesitates, now that he has begun to regain a sense of physical and mental propriety, a sense of self that conforms to the presentation of self required in the most basic social decorum. You'll have noticed that Antelm expresses considerable unease about this experience. He is haunted by it, he says, Descri describing this kind of effusion as hellish for the social creature he had been, but paradisiacal for him in its expression, bringing a joy so great that he thought it could bring his death. And let me note again that from what Muscular reports of the opinions of the doctors, it could very well have killed him. The joy is wounding for him, and it gives birth to something perhaps very close to what Blanchot will call in commenting Duras in his later book on community, La maladie de la mort, the, the sickness of unto death, or the sickness of death. Let me underscore with these words that Antam experienced in that deliverance of, of speech that occurred with his deliverance from oppression and the mortal dangers that he had experienced, the birth of an unruly freedom that grows and matures in the period of recovery. So that the crisis in which Antam writes during what was presumably the night of June 8th, that first part of the letter I read to you, is based not only in his sense that the aperture for a speaking of this kind is closing, but also a growing exigency of this faculty or this unruly spirit that demands to say all. After the storm on that night, which brings, as I said, a kind of catharsis and a renunciation, Antelm pronounces the end of what he calls, what he called the infernal or marvelous passage in which he underwent, I quote again, the extraordinary adventure of being able to prefer himself other. That's from the end of his letter. The event to which the letter gives testimony and to which Masculo seeks return in his fragmented effort at anamnesis is thus the close, opening and closing of that period of unruly freedom in which Antelm experienced the destabilizing exigency of saying all. A period that brought radically into question for Antelm both his relation to speech and his relation to the other, which probably cannot be a thought apart in this moment. This singularly distended passage begins, or originates, with the initial deliverance of speech in the immediate hours and days following Anton's rescue, an unchecked speaking, as I said, to which Anton can only testify affect, by affect, since the speech itself, in, in which all was presumably said, remains inaccessible to him, ineffable as Muscola will say. The event, after this flow that I've been describing, then unfolds with the maturation of that sovereign freedom that Antam describes as morbid, and that still speaks in Antam's letter, whose own language in Muscola's reading remains profoundly indeterminate, hovering between the written and the spoken in its singular form of address, another form of undecidability, if you will. The closure of the letter then marks the end of this event and the end of this, this free address. Moscolo's commentary, what I have called an anamnesis, since it draws from sources that exceed recollection or reflective thought to approach something profoundly repressed. Again, he had forgotten the very existence of this letter from between 1945 and 1985. This, commentary, this anamnesis, represents an effort to regain access to this event of speech, which in its inexhaustible and untouchable reality, as he puts it, 
constitutes, I quote again, that thanks to which our presence to the world took on meaning and remains founded. He's talking about Giraffe and himself. That event of speech is that thanks to which our presence to the world took on meaning and remains founded. This is, once again, I'm insisting, an event of language. And, this, and Mascolo insists on this quite strongly. It's not just uh, uh, Antam's return. It's this speech. An event of language that sent into a form of exile those who experienced it, most immediately Mascolo and Duras, and then Antal himself with them in a singular form of community. Robert uh, Mascolo writes in his testimony, I quote, remained bound to what he says in the letter all his life, and we with him. He threw us into the place from which he speaks, and we never came back from, us, from it. He had, in his return, deported us with him. So, end quote. To approach then in our turn what I have been tempted to term somewhat loosely undecidable, we have to approach that side of speech. Or perhaps better, since we are dealing with the letter, its space of writing, in relation to which Mascolo and Duras suffered a displacement so profound, according to Mascolo, that it produced, I quote, a communization of the soul that drove them and those who joined their company, including Blanchot, some years later, toward new forms of community. But gaining that sight of enunciation, or that writing, where the exigency of saying all was at stake, was hardly easy for Han Antelm himself in the first days, because saying all, as Masculo recounts, meant confronting and communicating a fear. Masculo reports that Antelm's first words were urgent, even desperate. He wanted to convey his experience in the camp, knowing that his death could be imminent. And I quote, in his physical exhaustion, he is nothing but speech. I don't need to question him. He says everything, everything he has lived for the last year, episode by episode, without order, one episode evoking the other. Keeping silent for more than a few minutes would be impossible for him. He speaks constantly as though under the pressure of a constant flow, possessed with the truly inexhaustible need to have said the most possible before perhaps dying. And death itself clearly was no longer important to him, except by reason of that urgency of saying all that it imposed upon him. I don't think we will sleep more than four or five hours during the two days of the return back to Paris. Mascolo tells us that he captured these faint words in an obscure fashion, claiming on one page that he would be unable to recall them, while noting on the succeeding page that he registered them in such a way as to be capable of restoring the essential should Antam die. Saying all then for uh, Antam meant, at the, you know, in terms of what, what I've been quoting just now, this meant communicating the experience of detention in all its dimensions. But it also meant, as we will learn now, exposing a fear, a fear of the more profound message that Antam bears and a fear for the possibility of its reception. I quote again, even though he, Robert, cannot be certain of his survival, everything he says to me, still punctuated in moments by visions, people, or sights, says above all the fear or the difficulty, even the impossibility, after having willed to survive, of living again. This comes directly from the other side, from beyond the grave, no doubt with the aid of the night. Now, Mascolo understands the difficulty voiced here as deriving from the self-imposition of a terrible responsibility. To choose to live, he argues, presumably from what he has heard from Antelm, is to remove from oneself every alibi with respect to what one does with this life. The burden is infinite. Mascolo goes on to add that the choice of life is made by one who has truly passed from life, experiencing not death as such, uh, you know, in the, in the concrete sense, la mort sans phrase, as he puts it, death without a phrasing or without a sentence. So not death as such in the passage to the other side, but rather that which can be reported of such a passage, such a dying, which is a death to oneself. This dying, however, and, Blanche, and Masculo learned this from Blanchot, this dying brings an opening to the other, or autrui and thus an opening onto what Antelm will name the unity of the human species, 
or the humankind, l'espèce humaine. This is the lesson of Antoine that he brings back from the camps, the lesson of the book l'espèce humaine, that there is, a unity of the, there is a unity of the human species. The speech that Antoine would have reserved from his oppressors, but to which he was exposed by that oppression, according to Blanchot, and which was then brought forward in the exigency of saying all, was the saying of this relation, which is brought back as the central message of Antoine's experience. That is the relation to the other, and thereby the experience of the unity of humankind. Mascolo, in a very Christian formulation that is characteristic of this memoir, calls it the news, la nouvelle, with which he, he returns. Delivering this news is presumably an important part of what saying all would mean for Mascolo in the time of his, uh, Antem in the time of his return, return. But it was in fact terrifying for him, more frightening than Mascolo seems to allow, though he describes this fear opening, openly. Writing of the first night in the presence of Antem's unarrested speech, uh, Mascolo writes the following. Of this death to oneself, with the initiation it supposes, initiating perhaps to no other mystery but that concerning the unity of the species, which is without mystery, always evident and always blinded. Of this death, Robert in this night brings me the news, la nouvelle, not in some sense of victory or some new assurance, but rather in the disarray, the confusion and almost shame that shame there would be in avowing improbability, incapacity, and perhaps non-desire before rebirth. Everything he says leads me to understand how he ended up finding himself constrained to be other, autrui, for himself. Taking over here Maurice Blanchot's words. This is Masculo speaking. He's citing Blanchot to say that Antoine has been constrained to be the other for himself. But at the same time, having lost himself to himself in this way means, and here is the confounding revelation, that there opens a future, in a sense, more redoubtable than death itself, namely, to have become for myself something sacred. Now, I have to go a little bit quickly now because um, there, there is an awful lot to discuss in terms of this, this uh, sacralizing gesture that Mascolo makes at this point. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to see that, that move, that gesture, as in some sense a turning away from something that can't quite be assumed. Uh, so Mascolo goes there and then backs, backs off and gives it a very, uh, you might say, theological um, or uh, certainly very religious uh, account of what has happened. So ag again, what, what provokes this fear? It has to do with what Antelm is returning with, this news, which is concerning the unity of the species. But to speak of this unity is terrifying because it doesn't mean some sort of identification with the other. It means that both the victim and the oppressor are capable of the same things and also exposed to the same things. The unity has to do with um, the really quite terrifying condition of being, as a human being, indestructible, and in that provoking a fury in the other. So Antum is affirming, ultimately, abyssal grounds in his relation to the oppressor and is terrified by the implication of this understanding. The unity is a relationality which is, as I say, abyssal. Moscolo himself must have known something of this fear. The mere fact that he could have forgotten the existence of such a letter for 40 years suggests that something in it threatened him. Its open impropriety may have sufficed for this effect. He might have <laughs> backed away from it. Um, and it maybe the message it bore was so profoundly familiar to him at that moment that the fact of the letter didn't stand forth for him in particular. But nonetheless, he forgot its message. He forgot its existence. And I do believe that there is real courage in his attempt at anonesis after those 40 years, in his confrontation with the question of what can be said or cannot be said, and in his effort to decipher the meaning of the letter for himself and his friends. But there's something of Robert's fear that Mascolo, Mascolo does not reproduce in his attempt to answer 
Antum's words regarding the despair that could easily overtake him. That answer of Masculo comes in the account of the effect Antum's return had on the lives of Masculo and his friends. It's profoundly deporting effect. Becoming Jewish, he spoke of a becoming communist, but also a becoming Jewish. With Antem, in the wake of the event of his return, is offered as an obscure assumption of the import of this event of speech. It is in this movement of becoming other, becoming Jewish, becoming communist, the working of a spirit that was less than conscious in its feverish stirring and pursuits, but which, for Masculo, assured a continuity with the event and actually, he says, made possible the anamnesis he's undertaking. By the work of this spirit, in short, he and his friends did not succumb to despair in the way Antum had feared. But Maskelo also seems to be defending himself from that possibility of despair, and his construction of the event of return bears marks of that defense. Here, let me return briefly to Maskelo's tendency to sacralize the very presence of Antum and the message he bore. Time hardly permits me to analyze the pertinent scenes. But let me note that in the pages following the ones from which I have cited regarding Antelm's extreme ambivalence with respect to his own decision to return to the world, Muscula provides an account of an incident in which he claims to see in Antelm's person the communication of the news with which he returns. The scene which Antelm names an Eke Homo involves Antelm's assisted entry into a brasserie in the course of his return to Paris. His appearance, his image, as Mascolo refers to it, provokes what Mascolo names, I quote, a common passion of thought, which is first an admiration of what is first recognized as, I quote, the preservation of a refusal opposed to what could be no more than an ungraspable neutrality of evil. Mascolo then qualifies this presence as one of a second innocence, a source of certain truth that provides innocence in knowledge. The legible silence of this presentation, Maskelo, Maskelo continues, was again an event of speech. The silence of the presentation is an event of speech. The avowal on the part of one who knows that there is no issue from the condition of being human, martyrdom itself not serving this end. That such an absence of escape also cuts off retreat in despair. So before Antam's presence, the strange presence subsisting in an effacement or in what Maskelo calls a uselessness of time, there is, I quote, a positive and stable indeterminacy between what is from here and what is from elsewhere. Before this, despair is not possible. Maskelo's response to the fear addressed to him by Anton, namely that he would succumb to despair, that he would lose the capacity to relate to that, that being in development, that free and somewhat frightening, monstrous, uh, being in, 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 being, being in becoming. Maskelo's response to the fear addressed to him by Antum thus takes the form of a reassurance to himself and to the reader that the link to the moment of their greatest intimacy is secure, that he cannot lose sight of the epiphany in which the ground of the intimacy he knew in and by Antum's effusive speech in the first days was given to him. Whatever contingencies might intervene, the despair Antam feared would never take hold, or so Maskelo claims. It is indeed quite a claim. And I hesitate to question it, even though it is not at all clear to me that it can be made consistent with what Maskelo evoked of the fear, the difficulty, and even the impossibility of living again after having willed to survive. I'm going to pass now to my second part. I suggested in my introduction that it is perhaps possible to hear in a brief text by Moïse Blanchot a second response to the address contained in Antem's letter to Muscolo. A second response to the address and to the fading of the experience that made the address so urgent in the night when Antum began his letter. This second response diverges profoundly from Muscolo's and is of a quite different tonality from that of the letter itself. 
But this very divergence is part of what prompts me to suggest that we deal with something perhaps rightly undecidable in Antam's experience of what's saying all to the other from the state of indeterminacy he knew implied. So let me now read this brief text by Blanchot entitled In the Night That Is Watched Over. I hope that if anything comes from this present tonight, t presentation tonight, you'll enjoy these two brief texts that I'm reading because I think they're both extraordinary. This is um, a text, again, written, um, if my memory serves it well, it's, it's 1992. I, I could be slightly off on that. The French is uh, dans la nuit surveillé. It's very brief. In the night that is watched over. It's often collected in Blanchot's political texts, interestingly enough. Um, and you'll see why this is possible. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a curious um, uh, editing gesture. So, in the night that is watched over. It is slowly. In those nights when I sleep without sleeping, that I became conscious, this word is inappropriate, of your proximity, which is distant nonetheless. I persuaded myself that you were here. Not you, but this repeated phrase, I am going far away. I am going far away. I immediately understood that Robert, so generous, so little concerned about himself, was not speaking to me about or for himself, but of all the places of extermination, of which, if it was him speaking, he listed a few. Listen to them. Listen to the names. Treblinka, Chernow, Belzec, Majdanek, Auschwitz, Sobibor, Birkno, Ravensbrück, Dachau. But, I say speaking, not speaking, do we forget? Yes, you forget. You forget all the more for remembering. Your memory does not impede you from living, from surviving, nor even from loving me. But one does not love a dead person, because then the meaning escapes you, the impossibility of meaning, the non-being and impossibility that is non-being. When I reread these lines, I'm still reading, I know that I have already, when, excuse me, when I reread these lines, I know that I have already lost sight of Robert Antenne, the incomparable friend I knew. He was so simple, and at the same time so rich, with a knowledge that the greatest minds lacked. In the experience of servitude that was his, even if he shared it with others, he kept the human truth from which he knew not to exclude even those who oppressed him. But he went even further. Not recognizing a companion, K, he had come to see in the infirmary who was still alive, he understood that there is a nothingness in life itself, an unfathomable void against which one has to defend oneself, even while acknowledging its approach. We must learn to live with this void. We will maintain plenitude even in nothingness. This is why, Robert, I still have my place next to you. And this night watched over in which you come to see me is not an illusion where everything would disappear, but my right to make you live, even in the void I feel approaching. I trust you'll have heard why I think I hear in this text an echo from Antum's letter, perhaps even a response. For although Blanchot takes a very different tack from Muscolo, he nonetheless attends in a very precise way to the claim that Antum made upon Muscolo. Muscolo was certainly aware of the claim. His effort of memory is devoted to it. Don't forget. But he does not pause over the right that Antam asserts in suggesting that he has a reason to fear Muscolo's reversion to what he names a despair. This claim upon the other to which I am referring may, in fact, have spoken in every communication Antam made with respect to his experience in the camps. As I said near the outset, it may have been part of what Moscolo described as the disconsolate side of his being. All who, who were in his company would thus have known it. 
So again, there's no way of demonstrating that Blanchot responded specifically to the letter we've been reading, even if he was intimately familiar with it, and he certainly was, um, by reason of the, I know this by reason of the circumstances of the publication. But it is striking that Blanchot seems to return to one of the most acute moments in Antoine's address to Mascolo, that moment when its urgency was most critical. Here again is the last sentence written that first night of Antoine's first act of writing. If you laugh, addressing Mascolo, if you laugh, mocking me a little, you respond, if you respond that you've never seen so much future ahead, I'll tell you that I recognized my right to this fear. In other words, if, if Mascolo says, oh, come on, you're, do, you're doing wonderfully, you know, we have a tremendous future ahead, at that point, Antoine says, no, I have a right to my fear that you're losing what I'm trying to communicate to you. And then here again is Blanchot's sentence. The night watched over in which you come to see me, which you came to see me, is not an illusion where everything would disappear, but my right to make you live, even in the void I feel approaching. In either case, the word right stands forth quite powerfully, even though it is spoken from one side and then the other of Antoine's passing. To establish properly the bridging and the transformation that occurs when Blanchot takes over the term, I would need to undertake a quite extensive commentary on Blanchot's understanding of Antoine's experience in the camps and in the ensuing days, and I would need to pause at some length over the term, over the term uh, that Blanchot uses uh, throughout the post-war period, which is effacement. Basically, he sees in Antoine's experience something he calls an effacement of the subject. Um, and this is something he thinks in his, as, as uh, proper to the experience of writing. Essentially, but all too briefly, Blanchot understands Antoine's experience to be one of extreme exposure to the point, as Mascolo himself notes, quoting Blanchot, that Antoine became other to himself, autrui pour soi-même. Or, as Blanchot puts it a bit more radically in his own essay on Antoine, he became host to the other. He became host to the other. When he returned to the world and sought to say all, he attempted to say what this exposure had afforded to him of a knowledge of the human condition. What Antoine would have said and presented in his person then was something, if we follow Blanchot, something like the pure presence of relation to the other. Not the simple, full presence of a human being, which serves as the ground for the identification that Mascolo thought he witnessed in that brasserie in Verdun, but rather the pure presence of a human being exposed to effacement, or exposing effacement. Saying all would have meant saying something of effacement, which is what Blanchot hears that night without sleep in which Antoine came to him. Blanchot was speaking effacement. You forget me. I'm going away. And in those words, the effacement of the word, of the, of the names, uh, Sobibor, Auschwitz, Dachau, and so forth. So there is a, um, uh, Antoine would have been calling Blanchot to hear this dissipating, this retreating, this, um, uh, this, this knowledge, let's say, that Antoine brought back, which is only given in effacement and in this disappearance. In Antoine's letter to Mascolo, the right claimed by Antoine surely inheres in what he knows of Mascolo and what he knows of their friendship. He's speaking to a very dear friend. It would also inhere, however, in the knowledge of the human condition he has gained in his experience of a kind of rebirth and deliverance. And I note that it is a right to a certain fear. Antoine does not know what can be said and what cannot be said but he knows a right to speak of his fear for the exceptional experience of having preferred himself other. An impossible phrase that also has a profound Blanchotian resonance. Having preferred himself other in his relation with Mascolo and Duras in the free speaking that constituted that relation. Having known this, Antam effectively says, I have the right to fear the eclipse in the possibility of a shared communication and I have the right to address you. Blanchot, a decade later, later, after Antoine's actual passing, and haunted by a claim like the one addressed to Mascolo, which might be translated generally with the words, do not forget, 
returns to Antelm's teaching to grasp the conditions of a different but not unrelated form of accompaniment from the one envisioned by Muscolo, a different form of being or what I would like to call a dying with, so more a dying with than a being with. Answering Antelm's teaching also gives Blanchot the capacity to recognize in that haunting solicitation something that we might call literary, but not for that reason illusory, as he insists. There is something real about this address in the night, which is coming in what Blanchot would call l'espace littéraire, the literary space. The solicitation is real in the night of its reception which is also, this night, a condition of effacement. And it confers what I think might be called a right to literature, where literature itself becomes a kind of watch over the living speech of the other, the living speech of the other, this surviving speech that comes in this night. I, I play again with this, this phrase, watch, I just so I know that this is very challenging stuff. The title of the text that I read you is in the, in, the, in the Night That Is Watched Over, Dans la Nuit Surveillée. And my reading of the text is that Blanchot, in and through this experience, comes to assume the watch in the night. And, and the watch that he is assuming is over the, the, the effacement of the other. That is what I'm calling dying with in, in, in this context. I summarize now very briefly, but what I want to suggest is that Blanchot heard in Antam's speech after his return something literary, which is to say in this case something quite real, in the right it confers to the one who decides to receive it to affirm a community which is a form of survival. Blanchot must decide to learn and assume Antam's words. In its very extravagance with respect to social usage, Antam's free speech or this freedom he knew in speaking to the other, by the other he had become, provided the moral grounds for what Blanchot would call another form of relation, another form of being in community, so undecidable in its character that, in fact, we have almost no other word for it than literary. Thank you very much. Thank you.